Welcome back to MACNA 2020 Phoenix Rising, everyone. Our next speaker is Colin Ford. Colin is a marine biologist, coral aquaculturist, artist, and filmmaker educated at the University of Miami and James Cook University in Australia. He is the co-founder of the marine biological art duo, Coral Morphologic, through which he operates the world's first multimedia coral aquaculture studio located in the heart of Miami. It is Colin's mission to bridge the gap between art and science by exploring corals in its relatable fashion, such that people of all ages can relate with the mystery and importance of conserving the world's tropical reefs. Here to talk to us about the sexual reproduction and aquaculture of the Caribbean rock flower anemone in the aquarium is Colin Ford. Welcome Colin to MACNA 2020 Phoenix Rising. Hey, thanks for having me, Kevin. I'm very happy to be here and uh, share with you all some of the things that I have learned over the uh, uh, both uh, observing in the wild, uh, collecting as a marine life collector, um, and aquaculturing them in the aquarium as an aquaculturist and aquarist myself. Um, so, you know, the Caribbean rock flower anemone over the past uh, five to 10 years or so has taken off in popularity as a, um, as a creature that we, that we keep in our in our reef aquariums, um, and for, for good reason, it, popularity it seems to have really taken off with the advent of the blue LED lights that really uh, make all of the fluorescence of our corals pop. And as you can see on the screen, um, this is just sort of a, a small selection of uh, the color morphs that you can find in this one species. So you know, all of these, uh, Anemones that you're seeing on the screen are all the same species, Phymanthus crucifer. Crucifer refers to uh, the cross. Um, and I think that typically you will, you will find in a lot of the patterns um, a hexagonal um, kind of pattern that, that uh, perhaps is, is what the, the crucifer relates to. Um, because of course, sea anemones, hexachorallians, uh, so they, um, they have a symmetry that is based off of, of the six, the hexagonal symmetry. Um, so, of course, you know, the fact that they are so fluorescent has made them very, very popular. Um, and with that popularity um, comes both a, a blessing and a curse for the species, uh, because pretty much almost, uh, I, would, I would estimate that at least 99% of all of the uh, flower anemones that you are going to see for sale uh, in the hobby are collected from the wild. Um, and, you know, unlike uh, certain corals and, and coralomorphs um, that are clonal, uh, where you can sort of remove a fragment from a mother column and continue to propagate it in captivity like we do with many of our most ornamental corals, um, the flower anemone is, is not uh, one of these creatures that can be uh, collected in such a way um, that you can leave kind of some behind to, to regrow, to actually physically extract them from the environment. Um, and so the aquaculture of these, of these becomes uh, quite important because as the demand has been going up, um, you know, it's not like we're in new habitats uh, here in Florida where many of them are coming from. Um, and so, you know, we have to be mindful of um, over exploitation of this resource. And so hopefully uh, what we've learned from aquacultures in coming years um, can uh, provide these into the hobby in a more sustainable fashion and maybe even be able to produce some really hyper colorful fluorescent um, color morphs that um, you know, are otherwise very rare. So let's, let's get to it. Um, I'm gonna start um, with a film that Coral Morphologic uh, made, I think it was about 2012, and we called it Into the Flower Garden. Um, and you know, as you can see, they are really hyper fluorescent uh, sea anemones and quite animated. Um, and so just the, just the sheer beauty of of the sea anemone itself is, is more than enough to kind of attract people in. Um, you know, we have visitors that come to the lab, they see them in the aquarium and they immediately uh, start asking questions and they wanna know um, 
you know, as much about these creatures as possible are always mesmerized by the fact that there's all these different colors and they're all the same species. Um, and so just want to like give the, give the, the intro of all of its, all of its majesty. Um, I guess that sort of ended abruptly. Um, and you can check out, of course, uh, you know, on, onto YouTube and Vimeo and you can find, um, core morphologic videos of, of all of, all of these, um, that I'm sharing today, uh, since I'm pretty much just going to be showing you snippets, but I think it's probably important to kind of get a sense of where these, uh, where these anemones are coming from. Um, and for the most part, um, I would say at least, um, 75% of the flower anemones that you will find for sale um, in the hobby have come from the Florida Keys, um, particularly in the lower keys. There are now um, anemones that are being collected and exported out of Belize, um, and there's maybe a few other places. So, you know, we're, we're at least seeing some of the collection pressure being distributed over a wider geographical area, but um, you're pretty much looking at the geographical area that 75% of uh, the flower anemones are coming from. So, um, you know, this is, this is pretty much only a 50 mile uh, diameter area um, from Big Pine Key um, all the way west to, to the Marquesas, which are west of Key West. Um, and there's a few different uh, where you find them from, um, and and there's a there's a few key differences between um, you know the, the the different morphs that come from the two different areas. Um, so the first area that uh, that I was with, and and for many years, you know, the flower anemone hit for for many many years. Was really not considered all of that uh, exotic of a sea anemone. In fact, I would say throughout the 90s and into the early 2000s, collectors were getting maybe a dollar or two dollars uh, at the most. And most of the anemones that were being collected were green and kind of uh, white or, or earth tone, sandy colored. Um, and they, for the most part, were, were relatively easy to collect. Um, because they were coming from shallow seagrass areas or areas of um, finger coral um, and parietes that made collecting of them relatively easy and they, they were found in, in a very high abundance. Um, so, I mean, you, you can kind of see just by, by looking um, that there are quite a, quite a number of, of um, of flower anemones in this in this video, even though they're they're quite um, camouflaged. Um, so you know when you when you when you when you when you see them in in the wild, you um, know you know we're used to how colorful they are under LED lights. They're actually pretty well pretty well camouflaged, and and you can see shallow habitats. There's algae. Um, there's sponges. Um, you know, sort of, it's, it's not, not exactly the type of uh, habitat that we wind up putting them into our tanks that are, you know, sort of more of a coral reef. Um, but it's beautiful nonetheless. Um, but, but they're easily, relatively easily collected in this habitat um, because the bottom is generally soft and you can, you can sort of scoop them up um, with your with your hands, uh, which is why they were so abundant and 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 really not appreciated for for many years. Um, that was um, you know until basically people started to realize that red color morphs you know were very um, hyperfluorescent um, and under LED lighting um, they they really popped, but the thing about the red color morphs is that they're really not that abundant in the shallow uh, environment, which as you can see in the video, I mean, the, 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 the predominant colors here are green and kind of earth tones, sandy colors. So, um, 
um, you know, one of what sort of selection is involved in the color morphs being preferential to certain habitat depths. Um, because it certainly seems, at least anecdotally, from what I've witnessed, that uh, you're more likely to find these, the, the green color morphs and the white color, the shallow water, and you're more likely to find the red and hyper colorful rainbow uh, morphs in, in deeper water where you're, there's more red macroalgae um, and there's more coral that have uh, brighter colors on them. So, you know, this just sort of gives you a little bit of a, of a, of a bound as to where um, these flower anemones are coming from. In the shallow water, they also tend to be larger in diameter, um, more robust. So when they're fully unfurled, you know, you're, you're dealing with an anemone that's say three to four inches in diameter. Um, whereas ones that people have really, you know, the, the color morphs that have really set off the, the, the collection craze um, amongst aquarists are those that are frequently sold as, as deep water um, anemones, though it's a bit of a misnomer because while they're coming from deeper water than what you just saw where you can snorkel in, in just a couple of feet of water, uh, these are coming from between 20 to 30 feet of depth, which is not that, not that deep, uh, you know, considering the range of scuba diving, but is certainly a lot deeper than, um, than the ones that are coming out of the shallow grass flats. So this is off of uh, Key West of Key West, um, though it's in the it's in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so the things that that I notice are that these are areas that receive a lot of uh, tidal exchange. There's there's quite a lot of of water flow that is going back and forth, uh, depending on whether the tide is coming in and coming out. Um, you can see in this environment, all of those, those quick movements that you're seeing are uh, clams and, and bivalves that are, are shutting very fast because I'm spooking them, I'm diving. Um, but there's a lot of filter feeding going on. You can see that there's lots of uh, gorgonians and sponges, um, but in particular, the, there's a lot of algae and macroalgae. Um, this was last, um, last summer, and you can see there was a, a kind of a green algae bloom going on here. And, and over the course of the year, habitats do change quite a bit, um, depending on the, uh, the abundance of the algae that is growing. But you can see that there's you know, red cyanobacteria, uh, red macroalgaes, uh, coralline algaes, you know, branching coralline algaes, so it's, there's, there's a bit more of the, the red color, but you can see that even, even still, they're, they're fairly well flushed. There's another, another video. You can see also that, that typically um, this company is, is typically uh, hidden uh, by sand or other, other debris that, that makes them pretty well camouflaged. Um, uh, you know, as a, as a diver and a collector, you tend to sort of uh, recognize um, pretty easily what you're looking for, but at first it, it, it can be um, quite difficult to, uh, to, to even see them in this habitat since there's so many little places that they can um, tuck themselves into. And they, they have a foot, um, you know, all sea anemones have a foot uh, which gives them the opportunity to uh, potentially move um, if they do not like where uh, where they are where they are, which is certainly something that an aquarist has to keep in mind when putting any type of sea anemone in their aquarium because they can potentially move and wind up sucked into your pumps. Although I would say of all of the sea anemones that I have kept in an aquarium, um, the rock flower anemones are really probably the most reliable stay in one place. And once they find a spot that they are happy, they typically rarely ever move. Um, protecting that foot is, is, is important. And so typically, you know, they're down in, in the rock. Um, and, you know, one of the things that is really important uh, when collecting them and just, and, Type of um, handling of it. Um, in my experience, 
most of the anemones that are damaged during collection, um, if they wind up with uh, a damaged foot um, or, or body on the on sort of the, the body column, typically they were dying of, of uh, some type of bacterial infection. Um, so it's something to look for when you're when you're purchasing anemone is to inspect the foot uh, and make sure that there aren't any um, any damage to it. And that's uh, of course something that as a collector. Um, you really have to be careful when you extract them out of these environments. Um, so on to the aquaculture and reproduction of these beautiful anemones. Uh, here's a picture of some babies that um, sort of released from uh, a batch of freshly collected anemones that uh, we collected over a decade ago. <clears throat> and um, you know, it's, it's quite likely that the stress of them um, resulted in um, the anemones eject babies, um, which is not uncommon for uh, coral reef organisms to, to spawn um, or release uh, babies or planule when they are, when they are stressed. But the first thing that you'll notice is that the, the babies are pretty much just miniature adults. Um, and that's when it comes to aquaculture of ornamental saltwater organisms, you know, the fact that we're not dealing with external fertilization, we're not dealing with um, a tonic stage, which you know, is, is typically what makes aquaculture of um, our saltwater organisms so difficult. We don't have to worry about that um, because there, so it's important to, to recognize that there are males and there are females and the females brood uh, eggs and give birth to these already have zooxanthellae in them um, and they already have tentacles and they can just start feeding like uh, like the adults do. Uh, so that gives us a, a real uh, leg up in trying to really have heard from Aquarius that when they buy the, they bring home uh, an anemone and, you know, they've released babies in the bag or, um, you know, after a day of in the, in the tank, they're already seeing babies. And that again can, can be because there's a certain element of stress that um, causes them to release the babies. But, you know, if you, if you find babies in your, um, in your tank, which is quite, quite possible, um, you know, if, you, if you're able to feed them powdered foods um, uh, or, or brine shrimp, baby brine shrimp, they will eat and, and they, will, they will grow. So um, it's always something that even if, you, even if you just buy one anemone, there's a chance that you wind up with, uh, with more in the future. Um, so this is some pictures of... Um, um, we had an outdoor system, so these were getting sunlight. And that really, in my experience, has been the key uh, to getting these flowers to spawn. Is if you have, even if to be, it seems to me that they are utilizing the length of day as, a, as the means of uh, synchronizing their spawning. And I've uh, experienced that in about May to June is typically spawning season. Um, and in tanks that get even indirect sunlight, um, they, they seem to spawn pretty, pretty regularly. It's not, it's not quite the same as with a coral spawning after a full moon and you can predict a, you know, a night and a time but um, you know, there's sort of a general time range, and it seems to be that it's in the it's in the evening or really late in the afternoon, around uh, four to six p.m. And there's still light, but it's starting to get dark out. Is when I when we've noticed. You can see clearly the males are releasing sperm, uh, and then in the in the lower right, you can see a female um, who's gathered up these uh, eggs and brought them closer to her mouth. Uh, presumably to increase the, the chances of fertilization. Um, this is uh, a that then, you know, once we started to recognize uh, some of the spawning activities, um, 
we were kind of better prepared to be able to, to film the event of at least the, the males uh, spawning. And so, you know, as you can see, it's quite possible that you come uh, down to your tank one evening and you notice that the water is a little bit cloudy. Um, and if you have flower anemones, it's something that you kind of really should be uh, considering as, as a cause of, of the cloudiness in your water because they, they can uh, cloud things up uh, quite, quite prolifically. Um, we've also noticed that when the flower anemones spawn, we've had um, asterisk nails spawning at a time. Um, and typically a protein will be able to handle um, a spawn like that you know, maybe if you have a very small uh, a small tank maybe you want to consider doing a, a water chain um, this is video from a 50 gallon cube tank that I have it's what I kind of consider my hope um, and you can see that the um, that there is a female on the right um, who's sort of gathering the, the, the sperm. And here's a, a very close close up of uh, male flower anemone releasing his sperm into, into the water. Um, these clips here that I'm showing you are from the visual album Tangerine Reef by the band Animal Collective that came out in 2018, um, and in that in that film you can kind of see a whole uh, from from the spawning to the brooding to the birthing of baby anemones. But uh, you know one of the things that to me strikes me uh, a lot at, at this very not safe for work um, video of uh, flower anemone spawning is is really just how how similar humans and anemones are um, quite evident quite evident um, but even though they're invertebrates we sh we share things in common with them that are 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 quite relatable um, and so as you can see it can be it's a very prolific event when the males start spawning. Um, Probably, probably good nutrients uh, for a lot of your other filter feeding organisms that you have in your tank. Um, but these are just the males. And so it's, uh, it's important to note that within this species, you have males and females. I couldn't tell you, I don't know of any way of sexing them outside of noticing when they spawn. So obviously, uh, when you see males releasing sperm, they're males. Um, and, and the females uh, frequently, uh, you can see their eggs or you can see them sort of actively gathering uh, the sperm that's in the water. Now, one of the things that I've noticed that um, is really interesting is that it's within the species, males and females can switch back and forth um, because we've had sea anemones uh, that one year were releasing sperm, the next year they were gathering the sperm. Um, and there have been some studies that suggest that this is in fact the case. In fact, I believe that they've, um, you know, you can dissect, a, read a study where they dissected a male um, and there were babies. So obviously, you know, that, that sex change can, can happen. Um, Perhaps it's spontaneously. It doesn't seem that they're they're, they're not simultaneous. Um, they're both male and female. It seems like they they're male or female. They're dioecious, um, but at the same time, they're able to switch sexes back and forth. So this is a really cool um, video. See the the females cycling the eggs um, right under um, the of her oral disc and near the mat. Um, which probably is, is a way to ensure both um, the eggs are fertilized and also to, to make sure that they're, you know, getting uh, genated uh, water for their best health. So here is a, a picture of some of the freshly birthed babies. Um, and on the left-hand side, you can see 
a newly birthed baby on the uh, mouth of the, the female. It gives you a sense of, of scale. They're only a few millimeters in diameter. You can see on the right, there's a mysis shrimp there um, to put that into perspective. So you're dealing with uh, two, two or three millimeters in size uh, when, they're, when they're born. And it, it seems to be there can be a range um, you know, where I've seen them uh, you know, up to five millimeters and as small as like one millimeter. Um, and, and that birthing process can, can kind of take place over a, a longer period of time. It seems like that um, the brooding takes place a couple of months. Um, so birthing tends to take place in the middle of the summer. So you know, fertilization takes place in May or June. The babies tend to be born um, in middle of July or, or, or August. Um, and this is um, a video from the collection of rock flower anemones under um, the Ecotech radions that we have in the lab, um, which again just really shows you just how how much diversity there is in in all the different color morphs, um, and it's really like the rainbow, the electric rainbow, um, and there are some really really wild color morphs that um, you know I think as aquarists we tend to take for granted. We only ever see the nicest, most ornamental varieties. Um, and when you're diving, you have to you have to recognize that you know maybe 10% of the flower anemones that you see are collectible, um, you know, ornamental from a um, from a hobbyist perspective. So we're really what you know five years ago certain morphs were very difficult to find. Now we kind of take them for granted wild you know you're dealing some of these morphs are are one in a thousand um, at least of of you know compared to just your kind of sand colored white uh, or basic green varieties so you know again to the, what we see in the hobby is not necessarily representative of um, what you see in the wild you really have to work to find some of the more exotic uh, flora morphs and it's important that we don't take that for granted um, because there's really there's really a limited number of them um, which is which is something to be concerned about there's a little baby right right there that you can see tucked tucked there by um, by the bulkhead and here's a, a little bit more of a um, full tank shot this is a like a 75 gallon um, Rubbermaid tub that was refugium and then um, pretty much became the the flower anemone garden um, and so these now are are, are relatively commonly available um, but again they shouldn't be taken uh, for granted and, um, certainly the, the the work that getting them is um, it's a, it's a lot of work. I think, you know, in our, in our hobby, we really, we really never, um, appreciate just how hard and dangerous a job it is, um, to collect our marine life, regardless of where it comes from, whether it's in Florida, where we have the laws, um, you know, to places off the beaten in Indonesia, um, or the Philippines for fish, where, you know, a lot of a lot of risk goes in, into uh, making sure that these beautiful animals get into our thing that we should always be mindful of. So this is actually a, a like a like a pico or mysis shrimp, and these are all little babies um, that uh, baby flower anemones in here that that have been born in in our systems that I separated and and put in this tiny little aquascape. I think that's maybe 750 milliliters total with the sump. Um, it's called the mini complete tank made in China. Um, it's kind of a cool, uh, tank and I still, I still have it. It's been running for more than a year. Um, and, and it goes to show all how hardy these flower anemones are, um, given if they're given all of the, the, the basic conditions for their survival. Um, here's a coral morphologic, one of the first coral morphologic 
we did was we don't really do living aquariums anymore, but uh, the Zero Edge Aquarium was was one of the first ones we did for Art Basel back in 2008, um, utilizing you know some of the first LED blue LEDs that were available on the market at that time. Um, this is kind of a, a more full frame shot of the Caribbean biotope. Um, and some of these, I still have the tank. It's just uh, to the left of me here in my home office. Um, some of these flower anemones now are over 10 years old, or I've had them for 10 years. Um, and they're, you know, six inches in diameter. They're really quite large. And these, these were, these were the, the shallow water ones. And like I said, the shallow water ones tend to be more robust and larger. Um, even the ones coming from deeper water tend not to ever really get um, all that all that big in my experience. So there there, there does seem to be some some differences um, to, to look at that from a genetic perspective. Um, and again, um, to go to back to what um, you know we take for granted, which is the the constant availability of our ornamental marine life. Um, this happened last year, um, you know, because there are no collection limits on the species um, and because they are so locally, they can be so locally abundant. Uh, there are actors that basically are running people hookah you know, rather than using scuba um, and keeping them underwater for multiple hours all day long collecting because there is no collection limits and you know reaching places by boat takes some effort you know they'll go out there for for six to eight hours and collect hundreds and hundreds of them all at once um, and that comes at a cost um, and, um, and 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 this diver um, I'm nearly certain uh, was was a collector of these sea anemones which again is something that we need to we need to keep in consideration as to where our wild marine life is coming from and, and give us more of an impetus to want to aquaculture them um, so that we're not putting the same level of pressure on these areas because uh, I'm not necessarily convinced that it is a sustainable fishery um, for years and years into the future. Um, and, and so I think that aquaculture is, is going to have to be an important part of that. But hopefully, you know, because we're able to um, identify males and females, um, you know, perhaps this is a really interesting opportunity to start doing, um, you know, selecting the most colorful um, broodstock and trying to produce really hyper fluorescent ornamental morphs, some of which, you know, perhaps are, are extremely rare or have never even been seen before. Um, so, you know, that is, that, that's, um, you know, speaking as someone who is a marine life collector, um, you know, there are benefits to having collection limits. And, and I think that if there was a collection limit similar to uh, the Florida Recordia, you know, the, Re the Recordia that we have here, um, which is basically 100 per license or 200 a day if you have it on your boat uh, with another license, um, I think that that would be, be a very reasonable uh, compromise for this species, given the fact that um, there are very few places where they are so abundant um, and we run the risk of over collecting those areas. Um, and there are, you can find them on coral reefs. Um, typically it's, uh, you know, you see two or three on a coral reef and they're usually deep in the coral rock. So extracting them is very difficult. Um, and there are, there are a few places where, you know, you can go and collect hundreds in an afternoon, which makes them vulnerable to over collection. Um, so that pretty much concludes my talk. I uh, look forward to answering some of the questions you might have. Um, again, aquaculture, it is the direction that as a as reef aquarist, responsible, sustainable reef aquarist, we should uh, I'll be thinking about moving towards, um, but you know that that future has tremendous opportunity for us. As I was saying, I think that the, the future of reef keeping is going to involve um, you know, selected color morphs that um, you know that then produce a whole new generation of, of, of hyperfluorescent color morphs that are very valuable. 
um, and that that should be an impetus for us to to try and and do aquaculture of the species on on a more commercial basis. So um, for having me here, Magna 2020. I wish we could have been doing it in person, um, but you know, next best thing is uh, is virtually. And hope to see all you guys um, as soon as it's safe to do so. So cheers, thank you. And of course, I should mention behind me in this screen, um, this is video from the Coral City camera. You can check that out. It's a live streaming webcam I'm located at the Port of Miami. It's been the project that Coral Morph Logic has really focused on in 2020 before we were social distancing and, and it's really only become um, that much more um, of, a, of a part of, of, of our output uh, given that people are social distancing and this gives people from all around the world a, an opportunity to appreciate uh, tropical fish in, in their natural environment. Um, and who would have ever thought that we have this much diversity, uh, particularly parrotfish. Um, and there's been a lot of those um, rainbow parrotfish that have been swimming around behind me. Um, which are, I think, some of the most amazing parrotfish that we have in Florida. So you can check that out, uh, CoralCityCamera.com. We're on YouTube. Um, I'm usually there in the comments, so uh, you come check us out. Find me there. So cheers. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Colin. That was a great presentation. Cool. Um, for, for those of you who want to uh, send messages, we'll have the uh, email address that you can send uh, questions to Colin at right now on screen and uh, he'll field those at the end of today uh, during the question and answer session. Uh, Colin, one question I had, what kind of uh, time are we looking at for uh, settlement and then what kind of size are we looking at maybe six months and one year afterwards? I'm just trying to get a, a question sure, as to that's a good, how, that's a good, good, you know, good what are we question. talking about? Yeah. Um, my experience is that they, they are not particularly fast growers. Um, but then again, you know, because they're photosynthetic anemone, um, I think most of us, um, you know, as far as the adults are concerned, um, you know, are relying on just the light, um, LED lights or whatever lights that you might have that are basically providing the adults with a lot of their energy through photosynthesis. Of course, they feed really well, both the adults and the babies. And I think that um, if you were to, to spot feed the babies and utilizing a, like a, a powdered dry food, um, and I think that if you were to, to spot feed them with a pipette, you can get them to get the babies to grow a bit faster. Um, but, you know, to get them to a quarter in size from, you know, I would say is about a, is about a year. So that's, you know, that's smaller than what you find, you know, in, in an aquarium store. So I think that most of the ones that we're seeing are, are a couple of years old, at least. Um, so it is, it is not uh, an immediate turnaround. But the, what's nice about, you know, flower anemones is that it's something that you can do very passively. Um, it doesn't really require any special um, separate aquariums or, you know, any real uh, larval rearing of live foods. Um, so it's something that even in a nanotank, even in, in an aquarium, um, you can raise a whole new generation of, of sea anemones. But, you know, as far as it being a commercial venture, um, I think that you'd probably really benefit from high feeding, um, which clearly you can see from the videos where the, the high tidal flow, um, they're, they're feeding all day long um, on, on particles that are, they're catching in their, in their tentacles. So, um, and I think again, out, being outdoors and having sunlight, I mean, in the shallow water where they're coming from, we can't even come close to the par that they're getting. Um, Though I would also say that, that they, they can retract themselves too. I think that when they, when they get too much sunlight, they also can pull themselves back into their, into their little holes. So, um, so I think you know, having very bright light and, and, and feeding is probably important for, for faster growth if you were trying to do it on a commercial scale. Excellent. Yeah. So um, hopefully maybe uh, Macna 2023, 2024, 2025, yeah. people inspired by uh, this talk can uh, yeah. come and exhibit and, and uh, uh, sell their anemones. Yeah. We'd love, love to see a, uh, you know, like a, a show off of, of who's, of who's got most um, fluorescent anemones. I think probably another question that people are, you know, in my experience, the, the mothers give birth to a great variety of, um, of different color morphs. 
Um, but there does seem to be specificity that, you know, if it's a, if it's a fluorescent red uh, flower anemone, you get more, a higher percentage of fluorescent red ones. But there is a, a whole variety. And again, many of them are just, um, don't have the fluorescent colors that we associate with um, the ornamental varieties that people pay a lot of money for. So, um, you know, but per, again, perhaps in the future, more selective breeding. I would imagine that females can be fertilized from multiple males, which is also probably one of the reason why you end up with a variety of, of different color morphs coming from, from one birth and one female. Well, thank you very much again, Colin, for joining us here today. And uh, everyone watching, I uh, hope that uh, if you see Colin in the future, if it's uh, during COVID, stay, stay those uh, six feet away, but uh, say <laughs> hi and pick his brain about this topic and many other topics that uh, Colin is uh, very passionate and uh, very aware of. So thank you again, Colin. Yep. Happy. It was my pleasure. Cheers.